folklore consists of legends, music, oral history, proverbs, jokes, popular beliefs, fairy tales, stories, tall tales, and customs that are the traditions of a culture, subculture, or group. It is also the set of practices through which those expressive genres are shared. The study of folklore is sometimes called folkloristics. In usage, there is a continuum between folklore and mythology. American folklore encompasses the folk traditions that have evolved on the North American continent since Europeans arrived in the 16th century. While it contains much in the way of Native American tradition, it should not be confused with the tribal beliefs of any community of Native people. Native American Folklore Native American cultures are rich in myths and legends that explain natural phenomena and the relationship between humans and the spirit world. According to Bartolkin, feathers, beadwork, dance steps, and music, the events in a story, the shape of a dwelling, or items of traditional food can be viewed as icons of cultural meaning. Native American cultures are numerous and diverse. Though some neighboring cultures hold similar beliefs, others can be quite different from one another. The most common myths are the creation myths, that tell a story to explain how the earth was formed, and where humans and other beings came from. Others may include explanations about the sun, moon, constellations, specific animals, seasons, and weather. This is one of the ways that many tribes have kept, and continue to keep, their cultures alive. These stories are not told simply for entertainment, but as a way of preserving and transmitting the nation, tribe, or band's particular beliefs, history, customs, spirituality and traditional way of life. Tories not only entertain but also embody native behavioral and ethical values. There are many different kinds of stories. Some are called hero stories, these are stories of people who lived at one time, and who were immortalized and remembered through these tales. There are trickster stories, about the different trickster figures of the tribes, spirits who may be either helpful or dangerous, depending on the situation. There are also tales that are simply warnings, they warn against doing something that may harm in some way. Many of these tales have morals or some form of belief that is being taught. This is how the things were remembered. Founding Myths The founding of the United States is often surrounded by legends and tall tales. Many stories have developed since the founding long ago to become a part of America's folklore and cultural awareness, and non-Native American folklore especially includes any narrative which has contributed to the shaping of American culture and belief systems. These narratives may be true and may be false or may be a little true and a little false, the veracity of the stories is not a determining factor. Christopher Columbus Christopher Columbus, as a hero and symbol, is an important figure in the pantheon of American myth. His status, not unlike most American icons, is representative not of his own accomplishments, but the self-perception of the society which chose him as a hero. Having effected a separation from England and its cultural icons, America was left without history or heroes on which to base a shared sense of their social selves. Washington Irving was instrumental in popularizing Columbus. His version of Columbus' life, published in 1829, was more a romance than a biography. The book was very popular and contributed to an image of the discoverer as a solitary individual who challenged the unknown sea, as triumphant Americans contemplated the dangers and promise of their own wilderness frontier. As a consequence of his vision and audacity, there was now a land free from kings, a vast continent for new beginnings. In the years following the revolution the poetic device Columbia was used as a symbol of both Columbus and America. King's College of New York changed its name in 1792 to Columbia, and the new capital in Washington was subtitled District of Columbia. Jamestown In May 1607, the Susan Constant, the Discovery, 
and the Godspeed sailed through Chesapeake Bay and 30 miles up the James River settlers built Jamestown, Virginia, England's first permanent colony. Too late in the season to plant crops, many were not accustomed to manual labor. Within a few months, some settlers died of famine and disease. Only 38 made it through their first year in the New World. Captain John Smith, a pirate turned gentleman turned the settlers into foragers and successful traders with the Native Americans, who taught the English how to plant corn and other crops. Smith led expeditions to explore the regions surrounding Jamestown, and it was during one of these that the chief of the Powhatan Native Americans captured Smith. According to an account Smith published in 1624, he was going to be put to death until the chief's daughter, Pocahontas, saved him. From this the legend of Pocahontas sprang forth, becoming part of American folklore, children's books and movies. Pilgrims Plymouth Rock is the traditional site of disembarkation of William Bradford and the Mayflower Pilgrims who founded Plymouth Colony in 1620, and an important symbol in American history. There are no contemporary references to the Pilgrims landing on a rock at Plymouth. The first written reference to the Pilgrims landing on a rock is found 121 years after they landed. The rock, or one traditionally identified as it, has long been memorialized on the shore of Plymouth Harbor in Plymouth, Massachusetts. The holiday of Thanksgiving is said to have begun with the Pilgrims in 1621. They had come to America to escape religious persecution, but then nearly starved to death. Some friendly Native Americans, including Squanto, helped the Pilgrims survive through the first winter. The perseverance of the Pilgrims is celebrated during the annual Thanksgiving festival. Revolutionary War Figures George Washington George Washington, February 22, 1732 – December 14, 1799, the country's first president, is often said to be the father of his country. Apocryphal stories about Washington's childhood include a claim that he skipped a silver dollar across the Rappahannock River at Ferry Farm. Another tale claims that as a young child, Washington chopped down his father's cherry tree. His angry father confronted the young Washington, who proclaimed I can not tell a lie and admitted to the transgression, thus illuminating his honesty. Parson Mason Lockweems mentions the first citation of this legend in his 1806 book, The Life of George Washington, with curious anecdotes, equally honorable to himself and exemplary to his young countrymen. This anecdote cannot be independently verified. Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, is also known to have spread the story while lecturing, personalizing it by adding I have a higher and greater standard of principle. Washington could not lie. I can lie but I won't. Patrick Henry Patrick Henry, May 29, 1736 – June 6, 1799, was an attorney, planter, and politician who became known as an orator during the movement for independence in Virginia in the 1770s. Patrick Henry is best known for the speech he made in the House of Burgesses on March 23, 1775, in St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. With the House undecided on whether to mobilize for military action against the encroaching British military force, Henry argued in favor of mobilization. Forty-two years later, Henry's first biographer, William Wirt, working from oral histories, tried to reconstruct what Henry said. According to Wirt, Henry ended his speech with words that have since become immortalized, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty, or give me death. The crowd, by Wirt's account, jumped up and shouted to arms. To arms. For 160 years Wirt's account was taken at face value. In the 1970s, historians began to question the authenticity of Wirt's reconstruction. Betsy Ross Betsy Ross, January 1, 
1752 January 30, 1836, is widely credited with making the first American flag. There is, however, no credible historical evidence that the story is true. Research conducted by the National Museum of American History notes that the story of Betsy Ross making the first American flag for General George Washington entered into American consciousness about the time of the 1876 centennial celebrations. In the 2008 book The Star-Spangled Banner, The Making of an American Icon, Smithsonian experts point out that accounts of the event appealed to Americans eager for stories about the revolution and its heroes and heroines. Betsy Ross was promoted as a patriotic role model for young girls and a symbol of women's contributions to American history. Other Revolutionary War heroes who became figures of American folklore include, Benedict Arnold, Benjamin Franklin, Nathan Hale, John Hancock, John Paul Jones and Francis Marion. Tall Tales The tall tale is a fundamental element of American folk literature. The tall tale's origins are seen in the bragging contests that often occurred when men of the American frontier gathered. A tall tale is a story with unbelievable elements, related as if it were true and factual. Some such stories are exaggerations of actual events, Others are completely fictional tales set in a familiar setting, such as the American Old West, or the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. They are usually humorous or good-natured. The line between myth and tall tale is distinguished primarily by age, many myths exaggerate the exploits of their heroes, but in tall tales the exaggeration looms large, to the extent of becoming the whole of the story. Based on historical figures. John Chapman, September 26, 1774 March 18, 1845, widely known as Johnny Appleseed, was an American pioneer nurseryman who introduced apple trees to large parts of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. He became an American legend while still alive, largely because of his kind and generous ways, and the symbolic importance he attributed to apples. Johnny Appleseed is remembered in American popular culture by his traveling song or Swedenborgian hymn, The Lord is Good to Me. Daniel Boone, November 2, 1734 September 26, 1820, was an American pioneer, explorer, and frontiersman whose frontier exploits made him one of the first folk heroes of the United States. Davy Crockett, August 17, 1786 March 6, 1836, was a 19th-century American folk hero, frontiersman, soldier, and politician. He is commonly referred to in popular culture by the epithet, King of the Wild Frontier. He represented Tennessee in the U.S. House of Representatives, served in the Texas Revolution, and died at the Battle of the Alamo. Mike Fink C 1770-1780 C1823, called King of the Keelboaters, was a semi-legendary brawler and river boatman who exemplified the tough and hard-drinking men who ran keelboats up and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Martha Jane Canary, May 1, 1852 August 1, 1903, better known as Calamity Jane, was an American frontierswoman and professional scout best known for her claim of being an acquaintance of Wild Bill Hickok. She is said to have also exhibited kindness and compassion, especially to the sick and needy. It was from her that Bret Hart took his famous character of Cherokee Sal in The Luck of Roaring Camp. Jigger Johnson, 1871-1935, was a lumberjack and log driver from northern New England who is known for his numerous off-the-job exploits such as catching bobcats alive with his bare hands, and drunken brawls. John Henry was an African-American railroad worker who is said to have worked as a steel-driving man a man tasked with hammering a steel drill into rock to make holes for explosives to blast the rock away in constructing a railroad tunnel. According to legend, John Henry's prowess as a steel driver was measured in a race against a steam-powered hammer, which he won only to die in victory with his hammer in his hand and his heart giving out from stress. 
theme ballad of John Henry is a musical rendition of his story. Other historical figures include Titanic survivor Molly Brown, Wild West showman Buffalo Bill Cody, and sharpshooter Annie Oakley. Fictional Characters Paul Bunyan is a lumberjack figure in North American folklore and tradition. One of the most famous and popular North American folklore heroes, he is usually described as a giant as well as a lumberjack of unusual skill, and is often accompanied in stories by his animal companion, Babe the Blue Ox. The character originated in folktales circulated among lumberjacks in the northeastern United States and eastern Canada, first appearing in print in a story published by northern Michigan journalist James McGillivray in 1906. The Lone Ranger is a fictional hero of the West who fought raiders and robbers in the Texas area. The sole survivor of a group of six rangers, he set out to bring the criminals who killed his brother to justice. John the Conqueror also known as High John the Conqueror, and many other folk variants, is a folk hero from African American folklore. John the Conqueror was an African prince who was sold as a slave in the Americas. Despite his enslavement, his spirit was never broken and he survived in folklore as a sort of a trickster figure, because of the tricks he played to evade his masters. Joel Chandler Harris's B.R.E.R. Rabbit of the Uncle Remus stories is said to be patterned after High John the Conqueror. Pecos Bill is an American cowboy, apocryphally immortalized in numerous tall tales of the Old West during American westward expansion into the southwest of Texas, New Mexico, Southern California, and Arizona. Molly Pitcher was a nickname given to a woman said to have fought in the American Battle of Monmouth who is generally believed to have been Mary Ludwig Hayes Macaulay. Since various Molly Pitcher tales grew in the telling, many historians regard Molly Pitcher as folklore rather than history, or suggest that Molly Pitcher may be a composite image inspired by the actions of a number of real women. The name itself may have originated as a nickname given to women who carried water to men on the battlefield during the war. Captain Stormalong was an American folk hero and the subject of numerous nautical-themed tall tales originating in Massachusetts. Stormalong was said to be a sailor and a giant, some 30 feet tall, he was the master of a huge clipper ship known in various sources as either the Corsair or the Tuscarora, a ship so tall that it had hinged masts to avoid catching on the moon. Legendary and Folkloric Creatures Bigfoot also known as Sasquatch, is the name given to an ape-like creature that some believe inhabits forests in the Pacific Northwest region of North America. Bigfoot is usually described as a large, hairy, bipedal humanoid. Generally, scientists discount the existence of Bigfoot due to the lack of physical evidence and the large number of creatures that would be necessary to maintain a breeding population. Most claims of Bigfoot sightings are a combination of misidentification, hoax, and folklore. Champ is the name given to a reputed lake monster living in Lake Champlain, a natural freshwater lake in North America. The lake crosses the U.S. Canada border, located partially in the Canadian province of Quebec and partially in the U.S. states of Vermont and New York. There is no scientific evidence for Champ's existence though there have been over 300 reported sightings. The Jersey Devil is a legendary creature said to inhabit the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey in the United States. The creature is often described as a flying biped with hooves, but there are many different variations. The most common description is that of a kangaroo-like creature with the face of a horse, the head of a dog, leathery bat-like wings, horns, small arms with clawed hands, cloven hooves, and a forked tail. It has been reported to move quickly as to avoid human contact, and often is described as emitting a blood-curdling scream. The White Lady is a type of female ghost reportedly seen in rural areas and associated with some local legend of tragedy. Common to many of them is the theme of losing or being betrayed by a husband or fiancé. They are often associated with an individual family line or said to be a harbinger of death, similar to a banshee. Mothman is a mythical half-moth half-man from Point Pleasant, 
West Virginia described as a large humanoid with moth features on its face and large wings with fur covering its body. Mothman has been blamed for the collapse of the Silver Bridge. Hodag the Hodag is mythical beast that is said to inhabit the forests of northern Wisconsin, particularly around the city of Rhinelander. The Hodag has a reptilian body with the horns of a bull, and is said to have a penchant for mischief. Other folkloric creatures include the fearsome jackalope, the Nain Rouge of Detroit, Michigan, Wendigo of Minnesota and Chessy, a legendary sea monster said to live in Chesapeake Bay. Literature Santa Claus, also known as Saint Nicholas, Father Christmas, or simply Santa, is a figure with legendary, mythical, historical, and folkloric origins. The modern figure of Santa Claus was derived from the Dutch figure, Sinter Claus, which may, in turn, have its origins in the hagiographical tales concerning the Christian Saint Nicholas. A Visit from Saint Nicholas also known as The Night Before Christmas is a poem first published anonymously in 1823 and generally attributed to Clement Clark Moore. The poem, which has been called arguably the best known verses ever written by an American, is largely responsible for the conception of Santa Claus from the mid-19th century to today, including his physical appearance, the night of his visit his mode of transportation, the number and names of his reindeer, as well as the tradition that he brings toys to children. The poem has influenced ideas about St. Nicholas and Santa Claus from the United States to the rest of the English-speaking world and beyond. Is There a Santa Claus? was the title of an editorial appearing in the September 21, 1897, edition of the New York Sunday. The editorial, which included the famous reply Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, has become a part of popular Christmas folklore in the United States and Canada. The Headless Horseman is a fictional character from the short story The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by American author Washington Irving. The story, from Irving's collection of short stories entitled The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, has worked itself into known American folklore slash legend through literature and film. The Wonderful Wizard of Ounce is a children's novel written by L. Frank Baum and illustrated by W. W. Denslow. Originally published by the George M. Hill Company in Chicago on May 17, 1900, it has since been reprinted numerous times, most often under the name The Wizard of Ounce which is the name of both the 1902 stage play and the well-known adaptation 1939 film version, starring Judy Garland. The story chronicles the adventures of a young girl named Dorothy Gale in the land of Ounce, after being swept away from her Kansas farm home in a tornado. Thanks in part to the 1939 MGM movie, it is one of the best-known stories in American popular culture. Folk Music Native Americans were the earliest inhabitants of the land that is today known as the United States and played its first music. Beginning in the 17th century, immigrants from the United Kingdom, Ireland, Spain, Germany and France began arriving in large numbers, bringing with them new styles and instruments. African slaves brought musical traditions, and each subsequent wave of immigrants contributes to a melting pot. Folk music includes both traditional music and the genre that evolved from it during the 20th century folk revival. The term originated in the 19th century but is often applied to music that is older than that. Earliest American scholars were with the American Folklore Society, AFS, which emerged in the late 1800s. Their studies expanded to include Native American music but still treated folk music as a historical item preserved in isolated societies. In North America, during the 1930s and 1940s, the Library of Congress worked through the offices of traditional music collectors Robert Winslow Gordon, Alan Lomax, and others to capture as much North American field material as possible. Lomax was the first prominent scholar to study distinctly American folk music such as that of cowboys and southern blacks. His first major published work was in 1911, 
cowboy songs and other frontier ballads, and was arguably the most prominent U.S. folk music scholar of his time, notably during the beginnings of the folk music revival in the 1930s and early 1940s. The American folk music revival was a phenomenon in the United States that began during the 1940s and peaked in popularity in the mid-1960s. Its roots went earlier, and performers like Burl Ives, Woody Guthrie, Lead Belly, and Oscar Brand had enjoyed a limited general popularity in the 1930s and 1940s. The revival brought forward musical styles that had, in earlier times, contributed to the development of country and western, jazz, and rock and roll music. African American Music Slavery was introduced to the British colonies in the early 17th century. The ancestors of today's African American population were brought from hundreds of tribes across West Africa, and brought with them certain traits of West African music including call and response vocals and complex rhythmic music as well as syncopated beats and shifting accents. The African musical focus on rhythmic singing and dancing was brought to the New World, where it became part of a distinct folk culture that helped Africans retain continuity with their past through music. The first slaves in the United States sang work songs, and field hollers. Negro Spirituals Protestant hymns written mostly by New England preachers became a feature of camp meetings held among devout Christians across the South. When blacks began singing adapted versions of these hymns, they were called Negro spirituals. It was from these roots, of spiritual songs, work songs, and field hollers, that blues, jazz and gospel developed. Negro spirituals were primarily expressions of religious faith. Folk Songs The thirteen colonies of the original United States were all former British possessions, and Anglo culture became a major foundation for American folk and popular music. Many American folk songs are identical to British songs and arrangements, but with new lyrics, often as parodies of the original material. Anglo-American traditional music also includes a variety of broadside ballads, humorous stories, and tall tales, and disaster songs regarding mining, shipwrecks and murder. Folk songs may be classified by subject matter, such as, drinking songs, sporting songs, train songs, work songs, war songs, and ballads. The Star-Spangled Banner's tune was adapted from an old English drinking song by John Stafford Smith called To Anacreon in Heaven. The Ballad of Casey Jones is a traditional song about railroad engineer Casey Jones and his death at the controls of the train he was driving. It tells of how Jones and his fireman Sim Webb raced their locomotive to make up for lost time, but discovered another train ahead of them on the line and how Jones remained on board to try to stop the train as Webb jumped to safety. When Johnny comes marching home, sometimes when Johnny comes marching home again, is a popular song of the American Civil War that expressed people's longing for the return of their friends and relatives who were fighting in the war. The Irish anti-war song Johnny I Hardly Knew Yet and When Johnny Comes Marching Home share the same melodic material. Based on internal textual references, Johnny I Hardly Knew Yet apparently dates from the early 1820s, while When Johnny Comes Marching Home was first published in 1863. Johnny I Hardly Knew Yet is a popular traditional Irish anti-war and anti-recruiting song. It is generally dated to the early 19th century, when soldiers from Athy, County Kildare served the British East India Company. Oh My Darling, Clementine, 1884, is an American Western folk ballad believed to have been based on another song called Down by the River Livdia Maiden, 1863. The words are those of a bereaved lover singing about his darling, the daughter of a miner in the 1849 California Gold Rush. He loses her in a drowning accident. The song plays during the opening credits for the highly acclaimed John Ford movie My Darling Clementine. It also runs as a background score all through the movie. The Yellow Rose of Texas is a traditional folk song. 
The original love song has become associated with the legend that Emily D. West, a biracial indentured servant, helped win the Battle of San Jacinto, the decisive battle in the Texas Revolution. Take Me Out to the Ball Game is a 1908 Tin Pan Alley song by Jack Norworth and Albert Von Tilzer which has become the unofficial anthem of baseball, although neither of its authors had attended a game prior to writing the song. The song is traditionally sung during the seventh inning stretch of a baseball game. Fans are generally encouraged to sing along. Other American folk songs include, She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain, Skew Ball, Big Bad John, Stagger Lee, Camp Town Races and The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Sea Shanties Work songs sung by sailors between the 18th and 20th centuries are known as sea shanties. The shanty was a distinct type of work song, developed especially in American-style merchant vessels that had come to prominence in decades prior to the American Civil War. These songs were typically performed while adjusting the rigging, raising anchor, and other tasks where men would need to pull in rhythm. These songs usually have a very punctuated rhythm precisely for this reason, along with a call-and-answer format. Well before the 19th century, sea songs were common on rowing vessels. Such songs were also very rhythmic in order to keep the rowers together. They were notably influenced by songs of African Americans, such as those sung whilst manually loading vessels with cotton in ports of the southern United States. The work contexts in which African Americans sang songs comparable to shanties included, boat rowing on rivers of the southeastern U.S. and Caribbean, the work of stokers or firemen, who cast wood into the furnaces of steamboats plying great American rivers, and stevedoring on the U.S. eastern seaboard, the Gulf Coast, and the Caribbean including cotton screwing, the loading of ships with cotton in ports of the American South. During the first half of the 19th century, some of the songs African Americans sang also began to appear in use for shipboard tasks, i.e. as shanties. Shanty repertoire borrowed from the contemporary popular music enjoyed by sailors, including minstrel music, popular marches, and land-based folk songs, which were adapted to suit musical forms matching the various labor tasks required to operate a sailing ship. Such tasks, which usually required a coordinated group effort in either a pulling or pushing action, included weighing anchor and setting sail. Poor Paddy Works on the Railway is a popular Irish and American folk song. Historically, it was often sung as a sea shanty. The song portrays an Irish worker working on a railroad. There are numerous titles of the song including, Pat Works on the Railway and Paddy on the Railway. Paddy Works on the Erie is another version of the song. Paddy on the Railway is attested as a shanty in the earliest known published work to use the word shanty, G.E. Clark's Seven Years of a Sailor's Life. 1867. Clark recounted experiences fishing on the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, in a vessel out of Provincetown, Massachusetts CA 1865-6. At one point, the crew is getting up the anchor in a storm, by means of a pump-style windlass. One of the shanties the men sing while performing this task is mentioned by title, Paddy on the Railway. Shaker Music The Shakers is a religious sect founded in 18th century England upon the teachings of Anne Lee. Shakers today are most known for their cultural contributions, especially style of music and furniture. The Shakers composed thousands of songs, and also created many dances, both were an important part of the Shaker worship services. In Shaker society, a spiritual gift could also be a musical revelation, and they considered it important to record musical inspirations as they occurred. Simple Gifts was composed by Elder Joseph Brackett and originated in the Alfred Shaker community in Maine in 1848. Aaron Copland's iconic 1944 ballet score Appalachian Spring uses the now famous Shaker tune Simple Gifts as the basis of its finale. Folk Dancing Folk dances of British origin include the square dance, 
descended from the quadrille, combined with the American innovation of a collar instructing the dancers. The religious communal society known as the Shakers emigrated from England during the 18th century and developed their own folk dance style. Locations and Landmarks The Lost Colony of Roanoke Island, in 1587, Sir Walter Raleigh recruited over 100 men, women, and children to journey from England to Roanoke Island on North Carolina's coast and establish the first English settlement in America under the direction of John White as governor. Virginia Dare, born August 18, 1587, was the Please subscribe and thanks for watching.